They didn't have previously they didn't when they were insect eaters. Have, uh, previously. So this isn't a matter of a few, a few decades. The tusks on elephants. Tusks on elephants, that's a, a less clear case. El the elephant um, life cycle is very slow. It's very Darwin actually mm -hmm. used it as an example because, because it's a legendarily slow turnover. But if you look at the records of shootings of elephants in Uganda from about 1928 to about 1958, another period of about 30 years, you find the tusks get smaller and smaller as the decades go by. Now that looks like a natural selection effect because uh, both poachers and legitimate hunters would have been going after the biggest tuskers for their ivory. And whether it's actually an evolutionary change is less clear. It could just be that we're seeing natural selection itself, the, the decimation of the, big, of the big tuskers, and so that's why the average tusk length goes down. And no doubt it will have had some genetic impact on the gene pool of the population, but it may be that we're not seeing that so much. I suppose the best example I've quoted in the book is the example of um, bacteria. Mm. Because unlike elephants, which have a life cycle measured in decades, bacteria have a life cycle measured in minutes. So and you, you can, can see evolution can in E. coli, for example. Can, that's right. The human embryo, you also cite, is a very interesting example. Yes, I mean, the, the, my chapter on that is about, it really takes off from a famous story, again, about J.B.S. Right. Haldane. Uh, after a lecture, he was once challenged by a lady who said that she simply couldn't believe that uh, something as complicated as a human could have, could have evolved from, in those days, she would have said an amoeba. Um, one wouldn't say that anymore. Um, in in e even given billions of years. And Haldane said, Madam, you did it yourself, and it only took you nine months. So that was the, that's the lead into my chapter on embryology, which is a bit of a peripheral chapter, but it's sort of showing partly that embryos, including human embryos, have vestiges of uh, past organs like gills. Mm. That's been well known in tail and hair and things like that. Well, that's an interesting lead in to, the, again, a major part of the whole notion of intelligent design is not simply the majesty and the awe, but the perfection. I think someone said, you know, the notion that this happened by accident is as if a whirlwind came and picked up debris and reassembled a, uh, a, a jumbo jetliner. Uh, you talk about unintelligent design, examples in nature that uh, don't make much sense at all. For example, the larynx of a, of a draft. Why is this important to you? If it had been designed, then an animal would, be, uh, would look as though it had been perfect from the start. It would, it would not show evidence of error. Um, there are numerous examples in animals of the legacy of history. There is a nerve in mammals which supplies the larynx for the voice box, and it, it starts in the brain, and it goes, um, what, what it should do, if it, if it was well designed, it would go straight to the larynx, that's what it's for. In fact, what it does is it goes down into the chest, loops around a major artery in the chest, and then goes back up to the larynx. Well, in a human, that's a bit of a detour. Mm -hmm. In a giraffe, it's a 15-foot detour. And I've actually taken part in a dissection of a giraffe's neck in order to find it, and we found it. And sure enough, it goes right past the larynx on its way down, goes within an inch or so of the larynx, and it could so easily, any designer worth his salt would have simply stopped it there, because that's where it's going. Instead it goes down into the chest, 15 foot, loops back up again. Um, that's a beautiful, elegant example of a piece of bad design. It works, tinkering after, after the event, no doubt, cleans up the, the mess, but, but it's not the way a designer would have made it. And I found looking at that giraffe stretched out on the operating table, it was, a, to me, a very eloquent testimonial to the fact that either there's no designer or he's a very bad designer. The, the form of the animal is the way you'd expect it to be if it had been uh, evolved by gradual degrees from a historical origin, rather than if it had been uh, an engineer sitting at a drawing board and saying, oh, no, that design won't do, we'll toss it away and start again. Um, an example would be the, um, the tube that leads from the testes in a mammal to the penis. Uh, the most direct route is not taken. Instead, the tube goes up, loops its way around another tube, the one that leads the urine from the bladder 
down, um, in, sorry, from the kidneys to the bladder, mm. loops its way around this other tube and then goes to the penis uh, finally. That is a detour. It doesn't make any sense. No designer would ever have, pl have planned a detour of that kind. The human eyeball is also kind of a design um, cock up in your perspective. The, um, the retina in, in mammals and fish, in all vertebrates, faces backwards. So that the, if you can think of them as photocells, the cells that are actually collecting the light, are at the back of the retina, not the front of the retina. The front of the retina is occupied by all the blood vessels and nerves and all the sort of infrastructure, which clearly, if a designer had done, it would be at the back. I mean, you don't put the, 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 the infrastructure and all the wires um, in the way of the light. You put it at the, at the back. It's because of history. It happened to be the, the way it evolved originally. That's the way it's been ever since. There's been lots of tinkering ever since to, as it were, make good the mistakes after they're made. But any designer worth his salt would have simply said, oh, we'll start again and turn it round. The obvious thing to do. Now, in, uh, in, in Darwin's time, uh, neither he nor any scientist really had any understanding of genetics or DNA in, in, uh, in particular. How has that aspect of science changed the evidentiary base in, of evolution in the, in the ensuing period of time? It's changed it enormously. Um, the DNA code is digital and it's universal. It's the same in all living creatures that have ever been looked at. Mm. And that means that you can take any two animals or plants you like and you can find recognizably the same genes. You can say there, there are minor differences and you can actually count the it's number of differences. It's scary how close we are to worms, for example. Yes, and some genes are much more similar than others. There are some genes that, that the genetics use the word conserve, that are conserved over the whole of the animal kingdom, for example, other genes that change a lot. But, so you can say this is the same gene in a worm as, as, in a, as in a human, and you count the number of differences between them. You literally count the number of letters that are different in a piece of text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is text, it's digital information, and you count it. Now, uh, you find if you do that for one gene that you get a nice, pretty tree diagram. It's a, it's a pedigree, it's a family tree. That's the only sensible explanation for it. Then you do the same thing for a different gene, and another gene, and another gene, and you always find the same tree. It all fits the pattern of a family tree, a single tree of life, the one true tree of life. Now, that is overwhelmingly powerful evidence for evolution. It even works for so-called pseudogenes, which are genes that have lost their function, that no longer do anything. Mm. They're just sitting there, like relics of a chapter you once wrote sitting on your hard disk. They're still sitting there, and you can still read them, but they don't do anything. And yet even they show precisely the same tree when you compare the differences between one species and another. You use the words time and time again, and I haven't noticed it in a lot of uh, other work, is that it's non-random selection. Explain to me why that's important. It's very important because the opposition to evolution very often comes from people who mistakenly think that it's a, a random theory. Mm -hmm. So they will think it's that it's chaotic. Yes, they will think that just because it looks, just because it's it's um, elegant and complicated and couldn't possibly come about by random chance, therefore it must have been designed. They think the only alternative to random chance is design and vice versa. Well, it's not. Natural selection is not random chance, and it's not design. It is non-random selection, non-random survival. The non-random survival of those uh, organs, those genes, which work. It's which are most adaptive to the environment yes. that they're in at the time. And it, it's, it's extremely non-random. It's, it's the epitome of non-randomness. If you seriously thought that the only alternative to design was random chance. Well, of course you wouldn't believe in random chance. It would be completely dopey to believe that, that living things were the result of random chance. And that's kind of where we started. For you, there is majesty in that non-random basis of natural selection. Expand on that just a little bit. There's more. majesty because of what it achieves. It is the greatest show on earth. It's superb what has been achieved. I mean, there are mistakes and there are interesting mistakes, but nevertheless, the, the, the grace of a swallow's wing, the, 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 the elegance of an, of an eye or an, or an ear, uh, a, the, a running limb, the think of a cheetah or an antelope that it's pursuing, these beautiful running machines. These are beautiful 
elegant machines that have a, a, a powerful illusion of having been crafted, of having been designed, and yet it isn't. It, yet it's come about by this unconscious, non-random, but nevertheless non-directed, unplanned mechanism. That is a staggeringly elegant thought. You created a tremendous controversy with your last book, uh, the, the God, God Delusion. Um, having done this one now, are you even more firmly of the view that those of us who believe that this greatest show on earth might have been set in train by some other being a God type uh, being are delusional? Well, that doesn't come into the present book. Uh, that, no, I that know. That was I know a theme of the, of the previous book. So I don't deal with that. There are, there are many people who do believe that, uh, they, of course, they believe in, in evolution because you have to. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the evidence is overwhelming. But they nevertheless think that some kind of higher power started the process off yes. or something of that sort, and that's what you're now talking about. Well, I don't believe that, but that's not the subject of this book, and I don't actually discuss it in the present book. So if that's what you want to believe, then you'll find nothing to quibble about, nothing to disagree with in, in The Greatest Show on Earth. I want to finish on, on that note because, I mean, clearly you had an agenda when you set out with the, the God delusion. What do you want to accomplish in this book? What do you want to leave your readers and our viewers with? Somebody who reads The Greatest Show on Earth and, and takes it in will end up being totally convinced that evolution is a fact, that we are cousins of every living creature on Earth, some close cousins, some distant cousins, some very, very distant cousins, but we have Co a common ancestor with every other creature, they will end up, if they read the book uh, in the way that I hope they will read it, they will end up completely convinced that that is a fact as secure as any fact that we know. Richard Dawkins, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much.